kicked in them. By the way, the yapping is not my dog. Mine are far louder and far more obnoxious. <laughs> so anyhow, this is all kind of fun. At any rate, we're going to talk about the key, the key terms we're going to talk about. And again, this is all in your book. Just a quick review of the chapter. We're going to talk about communication, field care notes, handoff report, instant investigation team, they call it II, the instant report form. We're going to talk about patient care report and patient privacy. Now, the chapter overview that we've got here, OEC technicians evaluate patients whose injuries or illnesses range from scratch in the arm to life-threatening ruptured spleen or worse. We've all seen worse up at Lee Canyon. Uh, after assessing and collecting the information of the patient, you're going to communicate both orally and written form your findings and interventions to other medical personnel. During the handoff of the patient, you must tell the next pre-hospital provider the information you've gathered, care rendered, and patient response. Uh, the medical communication needs to be consistent. Information passed along a chain may be critical to the patient's diagnosis and treatment at a definitive care center. And it's going to be used in the future to determine the output of outcome of any legal case related to the patient's situation. By the way, I need to kind of make a comment. We're going strictly by the book here because that's what the exam is going to be. This is the, we follow most of this at Lee Canyon, but things are not every detail that we have here. We do things differently, which you'll find out as you shadow us and go on your road to becoming a patroller. Uh, it's important for all medical professionals to use the same language when we're discussing a patient's condition. And of course, the word communication, since it's highlighted, is probably something that's going to be in the final exam, although I can't tell you that. Communication is a process where information is transmitted from one person to another. And of course, miscommunication can adversely affect the patient's outcome. And again, in your book, you see communications, proper documentation are essential skills that every OEC technician must possess. We talk about medical communication. It's a specialized form of communication to transmit healthcare information. I'm gonna skip down and say patient privacy is the practice of maintaining security and confidentiality of all medical records. Basically, you can't talk about people or anything about the accident other than what you need to do to give to the next level of care. We need to safeguard medical communications and provide unauthorized access to sensitive data. Now, as we go on, we're gonna talk about the instant reports that, that we fill out the hill. And we give these to the uh, patrol leader, I'll call it leader, could be the representative director. At the end of the day, these forms uh, are put on the desk face down so nobody can see them. Sounds kind of crazy, but these are little things that are important. In medical communication, we need to be proficient in two types of medical communication, oral and written. Uh, during the assessment, nonverbal communication is also important. You can pick up the clues by watching the other person's action. Nonverbal communication includes behaviors such as facial expressions, eye movement, hand gestures, touch, I think you can read the slide as well as I can, so I'm not going to read it to you all the way. When we're talking about oral communication, that's the way we transmit information verbally, whether it's by phone, radio, or in person. And rescue to patient communication begins when you first talk to the patient on scene. If you're dealing with somebody who may be mentally challenged, I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, we want to be careful that we're talking to the patient and not talking over their head. Now, when we talk to dispatch, again, as we go on to the next few slides, we'll talk all about what we do. But typically what will happen is we'll be in, in the ready shack at the top of the hill. We'll get a call, but there is, uh, looks like there's an accident, patient, somebody needs assistance, and they'll give a location. So what'll happen is, uh, if you're at the top of the hill, you'll say patroller so-and-so responding and you'll head down to the location that you were told. Uh, a typical thing, they say, this is Paul, I'm going to just transmit it as I would. Hi, uh, 
Dispatch, this is Bob. Dispatch says, go ahead, Bob. I'm on scene at the top, at the top of Bimbo. We'll advise further. Now that way, they're timing how long it takes us to get to the situation. Now, once we get there, we're going to do a primary assessment and we're going to tell them what the patient's condition is, what equipment or assistance we'll need. Now, here's where the acronym SAILOR comes in. You might, you might kind of jot that down or circle it in your book. We're going to tell the person that we have a female, 29 years old. Chief complaint is a dislocated shoulder. We're located at the top of Bimbo at the strip. We're going to need a toboggan and no extra patrollers. Uh, dispatch will then come back with the same, we'll read it back and say what we've got. And, you, and so you said that is correct. So now dispatch is going to send you a toboggan. You, as you go through your training, you'll learn what's in the toboggan, which is typically splints. Uh, spin, splints are there, blankets are there, and that's about it. So in this case, we're going to, this is what we're going to need. If we're an injury that where we needed a backboard or a trauma pack, we would ask for it. Now, within a few exceptions, you should be able to convey the information in about 30 seconds or less. Again, we're going to make sure that the dispatcher acknowledges your message. Patricia, break in and uh, say, and uh, if there's anything I'm missing, uh, feel free to, um, to mention it. We want to use common language, not weird stuff. Uh, just as they say, typical terms are affirmative, receive, repeat, or say again, go ahead, negative, stand by, and then standing by waiting for further instructions. Now, typically when you first uh, get to the scene, you're, the th first thing you're going to do is make sure you've got scene safety, then you're going to do your assessment. So it's going to take you a few moments before you're ready to give the information to dispatch. I should hey, say, Bob. Yes. Can I jump in? Go ahead, Steve. <clears throat> this, Steve. Hi, it's Tony. Um, I'm seeing a lot of blank stares from, from you guys out there and it's kind of hard to, to, to really, you know, grasp some of this stuff. <clears throat> when, you're, when you're communicating on the radios, we, make sure you guys just use plain text. Uh, the whole affirmative, uh, received, negatives, you know, all that stuff. Just talk like you would normally talk and ask for stuff. Has it, does anybody have any past history of using radio or talking on a radio with anybody? I do. Okay. I do have. So you want to be comfortable in what you're saying, and, but you want to make sure that everything you say is clear and concise. Okay. And before you transmit on that radio, think about what you want to say before you transmit it. Okay. And then make sure that when you transmit it, that they repeat it back to you or in the same aspect, when dispatch says something to you, repeat it back to them. So they know that you under, you heard for one and you understand it. Because the biggest problems that we have on the hill is not knowing who we're talking to, not knowing where you're at, not knowing what you have, not knowing what you need. Okay. And those are, it's really simple. That's all you need. Who, who, who am I, where am I at and what I need. Those are, those are really the three things that you need to communicate over the radio. Okay. Any questions so far? Tony, thank you for thank you for making the clarification. Thank you for breaking in. It's real easy to be a talking head, and I don't want to do that. Uh, some of the things I should mention, as long as uh, Tony's mentioned communication by radio, all of our communication uses a digital radio repeater. Now, what does that mean to you? Nothing except you need to push the button, hold it down, wait about half a second before you start to talk. The repeater needs to have time to turn on and let you let your communication be heard. If you think you can just push the button and say, Roger, and, and let go of it, nobody will hear it. So any comment on that, Tony? Uh, no, and it's, and it's always, hey, you, it's me. 
<clears throat> so if you guys can remember that, it's, hey, you, dispatch, this is Rizzo. And, you know, for, for me, everybody knows who I am with, uh, through my last name. If I say Tony, sometimes they get confused, but they, they all know the last name Rizzo. So if there's, if there's something that you are known by, that's the, that's the language you want to use. There's no, you know, the only time we get formal is if, if we're like trying to communicate to the top of uh, Sherwood or Bluebird uh, or whoever the patrol leaders are that day, we might get, we might get a little bit more formal that way. But for the most part, you're always going to be talking to, to dispatch. Somebody's going to be handling dispatch. You're always going to be calling dispatch. This is Bob. Dispatch. I need, I'm on. I'm at uh, Bimbo and, and all that. So <clears throat> one of the great acronyms that we have is, is keep it simple, keep it stupid. Um, if, if you go by that, you should, you should always, you know, be successful in your, in your radio communications. Basically, go. Go, go ahead. Wait, my... Well, I was just going to say, um, I've been using radios for a long time in the entertainment industry. And as you have said, but, you know, just keep it, keep it very simple, keep it very basic. And, you know, it cuts down on the problems that you can have. And you also got to remember, it's, it's not a means, it's a means to communicate. <clears throat> for the most part, we're doing emergency uh, incident activities, okay? there's going to be times where, Hey, I need someone to sweep out at, at, uh, the, the pondos today. Can someone take care of that? It's, it's not a, Hey, Bob, listen, you want to meet down for, uh, for, for tacos and, uh, and hot chocolate here at, uh, at, you know, in an hour, it's, it's not for having prolonged, you know, conversations. It's, it's for communicating, be short and concise, get the information out, be as descriptive as you can when you're when you're using the radio and that's that's the other thing <clears throat> we're so used to a visual media you know i'm not i don't want you to become vince scully describing the blue sky during a, a baseball game but when you're given a description or a report over the radio be descriptive of what you need what you have because that way it paints a picture in everybody else's head of, okay, if I know Bob's at the top of Bimbo, I know what that terrain is. I know what the area is. If he's describing to me a snowboarder that's got a, you know, open tip fib and it's, you know, I've got some bleeding with that. I start going in my mind, this is, these are the things that he's going to need. And I'm going to start pulling, putting together some supplies I'm going to start looking to get the toboggan going. There's things. So like I said, if you're descriptive in what you need, then the ball gets rolling a lot faster. Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. Uh, a couple, a couple, uh, let's see if it's going to let me talk. Okay. Uh, something else, realize that every other patroller is carrying a radio and we, these radios are being, are, we're using speakers. We don't have headpieces. So realize that you might, uh, well, an example, many years ago, uh, when we first started radios, somebody was we said, oh boy, look at these turkeys, gobble, gobble, gobble. Can you imagine what it was like when the person, when there was another patroller in line and people were next to them? Realize that what you're saying is not private. The, the skiing public and everybody else can hear you. Another thing, we don't use names on the radio, I should say, we should, we don't use patient names on the radio. However, we would use the names of a person we need a posting. We have a lost skier. Would you put the name X, Y, Z on the board? We do that, but we would never do a, Hey, I just found a Joe Smith. He's laying there with a broken arm. We would never do that. Any comment, Tony? Well, yeah. and, and with that too, is, uh, I, I know, when you when you're in a crowded area and we've got an incident that's working kind of be you know aware of the volume on your radio because we don't want 
uh, you know, if you're if you're down in the bar area, or if you're you're standing in line in in the uh, in the lift line, we don't want a lot of that broadcast coming over. So now people start asking you questions. Hey, what's going on? Uh, who got hurt? Is in and, and start bombarding you with inf with information that that you don't have and you're not really privy to give. So, something else that uh, would come up as you use the radios. When you're by other patrollers, you need to turn the volume of your radio down because if a call comes in and I pick up my radio and go to transmit and my voice is coming out of your radio, we've got feedback. So this is something that you'll kind of get the hang of when you're in the ready shack with a number of other patrollers. You know, most of you will turn your radios down. So there's only one radio blaring in the, in the shack. Anyway, rather than go through this, this will all make sense as you get on the hill. And I'll just kind of kick on these slides. I'm not going to read them all to you. I apologize for the sparkle effect. I didn't do that on these slides. It just came up that way. We talked about the phonetic alphabet. Uh, if you look at it, that's the right way to do it. But again, if you forget the uh, forget this and you say, hey, it's A apple, I don't think anybody's going to kill you. OK. Uh, Typically, when we have a, an incident, we do a 911 call and rescue comes over first from the Kyle Canyon side. They're going to be, they will get there before the city ambulance if, if, if we call for them. But at any rate, as other rescues arrive on the scene, you give each of them a concise oral report. It's going to be a brief description of patient's problems, instructions about how these rescues can help you, and you're going to discuss, you're going to, if you're on the hill, you're going to direct your assistance in a clear, calm, professional manner. And if you're on the hill by yourself and you have people who are not medical professionals, they're willing to help you, just be calm and in clear English, tell them what you'd like them to do. Like, could you help me? Could one of you go up and block the uh, jump so nobody runs into us? This is a typical situation where we're on the line. We've got the jumps. We have somebody below the jump. We need to have somebody close off that jump right away so nobody uh, skis over you. And believe me, it's happened. Uh, if, if, uh, if there's more than one patroller on scene, don't argue. Take it offline later. Be very professional. Be very mindful of the other person. Uh, can you go back to that one, the last slide? Certainly. Uh, I thought I would. Uh, let's see. Is this the one right here? So, I, what I wanted to bring up, there was a in that one of the in that slide. It said it talked about the lead patroller. Do you guys know who the lead patroller is? Anybody? Unmute yourself. Feel free to kick in. Usually, um, I'm ex uh, usually the one that's either more experienced or when you guys meet at the bottom, um, the lead patrollers are usually designated. I'm guessing. <clears throat> so are, that are would they, make sense, but it's perfect? actually. The lead patroller is the first guy on scene, the first male or female, the first patroller on scene. Okay. Yep. And I'm going to push that a lot for you guys uh, uh, that you're not comfortable with taking a, 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 a lead role. But in reality, you get dispatched to a skier down. You get on scene first. You're the person in charge. You need to understand that. Okay. You're going to be that lead patroller. You're the person in charge. Doesn't matter if you got an hour on the hill or 10 years on the hill. First person on scene is always going to be the first person in charge. Now, with that said, like, like you alluded to, if someone comes up and has more experience, okay, and they see that you're struggling or you let them know I'm struggling, then that person should have – the professionalism to be able to ease themselves into that position and let your let yourself ease yourself out of that position. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Okay. So that's one of the things that I, that I push hard, especially when we start going over the incident command system is somebody has to be in charge. And a lot of our, a lot of new patrollers, aren't used to being in charge in in their normal lives or the professional lives they've already they've always got to um 
answer to somebody. In, in patrolling or in emergency services, somebody has to be in charge from the very beginning. Because what they do, what their actions do in that very onset is, is how the rest of that incident's gonna go. So when, if you get that, if every, every one of you puts it in your mind now that, hey, I got dispatched, there's three or four of us that are headed over to this, uh, uh, we'll keep using bimbo, but we're all heading to bimbo and Michael, you get there first, you're in charge. Okay? Sure. Uh, you, yep. you take control of the scene, you take control of the patient, and then as others arrive, if you're able to handle it, you start telling people what you need, you start making, and you should be the one doing the communications to dispatch because you're on scene, you're gathering the information, and, and you, you, you should have the, the, the best understanding of what's going on to be able to communicate. If not, then so, kind of slide yourself out of that position, transfer the information that you have to whoever you're going to transfer your authority to, and, and then be in a position to help that person. Makes total sense. You got, um, folks, I want to kind of mention, I'm using these slides because they reflect exactly what's in the book. Uh, and that's because of the testing. I was going to modify them to make them kind of match the area. And uh, Patricia and I spoke about this. We decided not to. So we'll kind of flip through the slides. And as Tony is doing, we'll kind of ad lib and do things that are best. So in, in this slide where they talk about listening to others and helping, um, the world I came from or was in for a long, long time was, is, was technical rescue. And you have a lot of input, just like on the Hill, you're gonna be getting a lot of input from different people. Hey, I think we should do this. At one certain point in time, and, and this was one of my big things uh, on the fire service, I would get to a point, I would like one voice, one voice. I, I can take your suggestions, but at, at, the, at the end of it, whoever's in charge is gonna make a decision. It's gonna be one voice and we're gonna follow that one voice. So you gotta make sure that you respect the person that's in charge and that you give them the information that they need to make this successful and that at a certain point in time, the communication has to come down to one voice. I think we already mentioned that if you're alone on the scene, a bystander may be willing and able to help you. You've got to talk in a language they understand. Very simple, makes sense. Now, once the patient has arrived, the first aid station or medical facility, we call, you'll hear us use the word FAR, F-A-R, which is the first aid room, or in some cases, depending on what the situation is, they'll go to base medical, which is a little area right alongside the Sherwood lift. Uh, now, generally, uh, generally the patroller who's first on will stay with the patient. But on the other hand, uh, sometimes we have base medical, the FAR staff, that's more advantageous for the patroller, the first on to get back on the hill. In that case, you want to provide a concise, concise oral handoff and report to the person. Now, case, yeah, give the, give, the, give the person you're handing the patient off to full information so they know what to do. Now, medical communication on the oral. This is John Smith. He's 29. His uh, chief complaint is a, uh, a dislocated shoulder. Uh, we've, so we've already talked about that. The assessment, we found that he's A and O times four. Now you'll hear what these mean, but that's the alert and oriented. Uh, the treatment we've given him, we, put, we tried to put him in a sling. We weren't able to do it. Uh, as we come off the hill, we probably will not have done vital signs on the hill in most cases and immediate care requ requirements. So at that point in time, the other person can take over the patient. It should take about 30 seconds, maybe a minute to complete. 
Tony, have I missed it? Bruce, have I missed anything? No. I stuttered a little bit, but uh, all right. Well, now we talk about written communication. I'm going to mention something because you're going to see it later on. If it's not written down, it didn't happen. Kind of say to yourself, if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. I can tell you when I started patrolling many years ago, a patient fell down. First thing they wanted was to know if a doctor was available. I then moved to the East Coast. First thing they wanted to know was a lawyer available. It wasn't a good feeling to me, but we always have to assume that something could happen a year or two down the road. Uh, the patient, uh, the patient uh, has a limp from the injury they, they sustained. They're gonna try and blame it on patrol, the area and so on. So we wanna be very concise and detailed when we fill out the incident reports and you're gonna see these. So we have, we have set report forms uh, on the Hill, but like Bob said, if you, did, if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. And we all like to think that, oh, um, we have great memories and that when, if something is going to go to court, it's going to happen within a month or two. And, and I will tell you from experience, I've been, I've been brought into uh, court cases that are like four years, five years down the road. And when they ask you, don't you remember this? They're in awe that you're like, no, I don't, because they think that the incident that they're dealing with was the most horrific and most important thing that happened in their life. And to you, it's just one of a hundred that, you know, you ran on for that season. And it's, if it's not for the fact that you have a nice, well-written report with details that you are able to hold up and like, nope, this is what I saw, this is what I did, and this was the outcome. So <clears throat> take time to write on a clear, legible, and you know, information filled is report. And if you need to take another piece of paper and add an addendum to your report, I, I would suggest you do that. A, a lot of the stuff that you guys are going to go on and deal with are, are going to be just, you know, sprains, strains, and broken bones, okay, dislocations, you know, fairly minor stuff. But there's going to be one or two incidents this year, like the year before and the year before and the year before, where we've had people that have died on the hill. We've had people that have gone into cardiac arrest. We have had people that have uh, been hurt by the um, disregard for safety by somebody else on the hill that's, and it's gone to court. And if you're unfortunate to be involved in that incident, the only thing that's going to cover your ass is that little crummy piece of report writing that you're going to do in FAR. So I don't, I'm not trying to scare you guys. I'm just trying to let you know about the reality. 99% of the stuff that you do on a hill is going to be nothing, absolutely nothing. But somebody this year is going to have the misfortune of running on somebody that's going to get hurt seriously. And to protect yourself and the resort, you need to make sure that you do good documentation. Okay, Tony, I think I want to move on and we're not, we're going to be oh, uh, trying, to drag out a little bit. Uh, very quickly, you noticed in the book, we talked about field care notes, incident report forms and patient care reports. Uh, field care notes are typically if you carry a little notebook and you kind of write things down. The incident report form, which is shown in the book, will flip down, is something you really can't fill out on the hill. You've got to do it in the first aid room. It's got a lot of blanks, they're small and it's hard to, and when the snow's out, it's hard to write on the form. Uh, patient care reports, we have some forms that we use in the first aid room, and not the ones you see in the book, but if we've got somebody in there, and we do, uh, and they're there for a period of time, we're taking vitals, so we'll have a record of vitals. These are some of the patient care reports we use. 
The book also talked about uh, electronic uh, patient care forms. Uh, we don't have consistent Wi-Fi coverage across the hill, so we're not using them. We're also not using the multi-copy form that you saw pictures of. Uh, something that we need to be very careful of, and that's be sure to get witnesses name and contact information on the form of advice for it. Very necessary. Let's, let's flip along a little bit and we'll kind of go into some more. This is the form that we use on the Hill. <coughs> Hopefully each of you has a book. You're not trying to read it from my slides. You're going to see lots and lots of blanks. Let me tell you, uh, you need to fill it out. I think, think some of the critical areas that we talked about are the description of the accident and, and the patient's own words. Like, uh, I know I shouldn't have been on that hill. On that hill, I'm a beginner. I just got going too fast. Boy, that's important to put on there, because if it does come to a lawsuit later on, these words will be critical. You notice on there that there's also a spot for the injured, injured signature, where the injured, where you said, "Look, I've written down what you said. Is this correct? If it's not, you need to correct it." As we go through this, you're going to see how we do corrections. Uh, if you have to do a correction, you, you do a single line scratch out, you initial and date and date the uh, correction. You don't try and uh, scratch it, don't try and obliterate it, don't try to erase it. So again, part of the form asks, describe what happened. I know I was going too fast. I shouldn't have been on that slope. That's, we, we hear that a lot. You notice on the report also, there's a lot of, there's a lot of information that's just checkbox. So, it, you know, save yourself some time. If you can hit those checkboxes, make sure you hit the checkboxes that are there, you know, to back up with your statement. One of the, the things that you'll see on there too, uh, and I'm, I still have a hard time remembering to do them, is if they're in rental equipment, is a big deal of documenting the rental equipment that they're using, because that's another thing that can come back onto the resort of, <clears throat> all right, they're, they're in rentals. And one of the things they asked for is the DIN setting. Does everybody know what the DIN setting is on the skis? No. Yeah, the binding, uh, basically the uh, force of the binding that releases. Like exactly. That, so yeah. on your skis, there's a, there's a DIN setting and, and it's adjusted to, the, your abilities. So if you're a beginner, it's set at a lower setting. So it releases your boot out of the binding easier. If you're more advanced, it's tightened down and it's harder for your boot to come out of the ski. So one of the things they'll look at is they had a DIN setting of, uh, of eight or 10, which is more of an intermediate skier and they were a beginner. So did the DIN setting have anything to do with their injury? So that those are some of the things that, you know, you've got to take mind of when you're filling out these reports. By the way, since you mentioned uh, the area rentals, when, again, as you patrol, you'll find out there's an additional form, just a very brief piece of paper. But if somebody gets injured using area rentals, we quarantine the skis or the boots, we, we quarantine the equipment, take it with a form, to the rental area. The reason why is they want to check, uh, they want to check and see if the equipment malfunction, and so it's quarantined until they do that. Uh, by the way, you you you'll see you'll have an issue because how do we get to the how do we get to the first day? How do we get to rentals? Well, their their street clothes are rentals, so we're going to have to get there. If necessary, we can call. Uh, see if this is correct. If they, if they, if they can't walk, uh, we can bring them up by snowmo. Is that still the procedure, uh, Patricia? Riz? No. Okay. Alrighty. Would you kind of chime in and say what the procedure is then? What to bring the rentals? No. If we've got, if we've got somebody down in the first aid room, they've got a broken leg. We'll say, uh, they've got rental equipment. So we need to get their skis, boots, and so on back up to rentals, but their street clothes are up at the rental area. Do we? Uh, how do we do it? How do we? How do we get the 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 
injured together with the their equipment? Well, there's different ways. It depends on the incident, but there's management that helps us, um, staff that helps us. So each one is different, but we do manage to get everything done. Okay. Alrighty. I think we see here on the big slide the information that's collected, patient identification, names, witnesses, the first aid care that we gave on the hill, what we gave them in the first aid room. And of course, witness information is very critical. I saw him fall, he was skiing out of con control. We want that witness's name so that they can, if, if something does happen, uh, we can take care of it. I mentioned patient care reports and you're seeing some kind of neat stuff in the book where you're seeing the digital patient care report. We don't have that. No. So we talk about patient care reports having several formats, closed, open, and mixed. That's great if we have check marks. Again, we're not using these forms, but again, we're going by the NSP class here. Uh, I got to tell you, the... Uh, yeah, I guess. Go ahead, David. Did you have All right, yeah. What is the PCR again? Well, PCR is a patient care report. I'm going to flip down a slide or two and you're going to see what we had in the book. And I'm going to go back. Here is a, a patient care report that apparently is used in some EMS applications. We do not use it. It's so just, just as a point of interest, this is what it is since you asked. But as part of our patient care report that we do use, we do use the uh, uh, record of vitals. First is in the first aid room for a period of time. We're going to give it, we're going to record vitals. That becomes part of their record. So typically what we've got in it's the forms we use, I'll kind of mention them. Again, don't try and memorize them here. They'll all make sense and you have copies to carry with you. You know about the incident report. All right, if there's a collision between two skiers or two boarders and so on, we have a collision report. Uh, person is in a class. Uh, we we'll probably have instructor comments like, uh, and that's important. Uh, I mentioned to you that if a if an injured is using area rentals, uh, we have a very short form which goes up with the skis to rental, and they'll check to make sure that the bindings are functioning properly. There is an additional patroller comments form. Riz, what have I left out? Uh Nothing that I could think of. Okay. David, is that, does that kind of help? Kind of? Yes, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, these are all documents that are part of the, situ part of the uh, patient care reports. Again, we're not using the online ones. We're not using the fill in the blank ones. I'm going to show you some acronyms. And I have to tell you, all these acronyms were drive acronyms were driving me nuts at first. But if you kind of go through them, they make a lot of sense. And here are the acronyms we talk about. Soap and cheated. I, my goodness gracious, what in the world is this? <laughs> let's go down. Let's go look. Okay. If you kind of, as you start up, uh, soap makes sense. Soap is subjective. It's the symptoms the patient describes. Like I fell, my shoulder is really burning. Uh, oh, have you... Um, Ever had, have you ever had an injury to that shoulder before? So, so this is important. It kind of reminds you to get the subjective information. Objective, signs or observable quantitative findings discovered during the scene, size up, and physical exam, including vital signs. Assessment, that's a general impression of the medical problem. Like he had a broken leg. I think we'd be more professional than that, but that's kind of the layman. Remember I told you, I was not a medical professional and plan. What are we going to do for the patient? Well, we're going to, we're going to split him. We're going to uh, find out uh, whether he needs to be sent down by ground ambulance, air transport, or whether they go down a private car. So with, so just remember subjective is everything the patient tells you. Objective is everything that you found out about the patient through assessment, through vitals. <clears throat> assessment, your general impression, never say 
he has a broken ankle. It don't matter if it's turned around 360 degrees, it's a possible ankle fracture. Everything is possible, okay? But when you, when you make that assessment and you write that down, that you think the patient has a fractured ankle, then your plan of treatment better include the fact that you splinted, that you check distal pulses, that you checked above the injury, it better reflect what you did for that patient concerning your, your feeling that he had this specific injury. So when, whatever you put down as your assessment, whether it's a chest, chest somebody with having a, a cardiac event, chest pain, okay? And you put down there your assessment as he's having an MI. You better make sure that your assessment and your, your treatment plan covers everything that it would take to take care of somebody having chest pain. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I'm just going to jump in for a second. So if you have uh, a skier that's complaining that he fell and he has shortness of breath, but you don't treat the shortness of breath and you do a, an assessment all the way through and you splint or you do something, but you never address the shortness of breath, and yet that's what he's complaining about, then um, you need to review your, your plan because if he's got shortness of breath, what are you gonna give him? Oxygen. You're gonna give him oxygen. Now let's say that he, he goes unconscious because he has shortness of breath and you didn't treat what he was complaining about, that is serious. So don't be sidetracked by maybe he hurt his leg, but he's really complaining of shortness of breath. And, and staying with the shortness of breath, okay, so they have shortness of breath. So don't, when we get further into your, your training in the respiratory system, you know, what causes shortness of breath? Well, did you take lung sounds? Right. So if, if, if you're dealing with any kind of respiratory, emer, you know, emergency, one of the things that you need to be able to do is, is listen for uh, lung sounds and describe what the chest looks like. So and again, it goes done. back to if, if you have a general impression of a medical problem, then your treatment plan needs to reflect what you thought that person was having a problem with. Right. And then, then you have to go back and you document everything that you did. And what you found. Yeah, so it, it, the, shortness, the shortness of breath is, is, is a subjective, uh, it's subjective from the patient, but to be objective, you're going to have to check. And, and so you can dress uh, an assessment and then do a plan or not if, if there's nothing really that you can find. Well, the subjective is the patient saying he's complaining of shortness of breath. Yeah. The objective is I'm looking at his, how's he breathing? Is his, is his breathing labored? Yes, it is. Um, I'm, I'm looking at his chest. Does he have any injuries, trauma to his chest that might cause it to be labored? Mm -hmm. um, is, is his uh, uh, respirations deep, hard? Is it, how's he positioning himself? He's in a, what we call a tripod position. Is he leaning forward? Is he gasping for air? Uh, did I listen to his lungs? I heard lung sounds on one side, but not the other. Uh, what do they sound like? Were they like a wheezing sound or did it sound like he had he was breathing through a straw so i'm, I'm going to describe those are my objective findings and then i'm going to make a general assessment of it and then i'm going to i'm going to treat him accordingly does that make sense 100 percent. okay okay so we've got the soap so again Let's go into the next acronym, which is cheated. Wow. I never heard of this one. <laughs> Tony, when I, Riz, when I opened the book here, I said, what in the world? I hadn't either, but it's, it's, I think it's a good checklist. I, I, again, I don't want to acronym everybody to death, but normally you think, well, what's the chief complaint? What's the primary problem? History, we take the sample history. Examination, we're going to look at the, uh, we're going to do a physical exam. Assessment, what's our general impression? Treatment, all aspects of the treatment rendered. 
Evaluation changes the patient's condition over time. What was the patient's response to treatment? We do see that. Remember, the base is at about 8,600 feet. Some people come up, they've got some um, issues with oxygen. And finally, disposition. Uh, that's another form. Uh, we have a refusal form. That's important. Now, uh, if they refuse treatment, you want to ideally have them sign the, sign the document that they're refusing first aid, okay? Uh, if they won't sign it, you sign it, get a witness or two to sign it as well, that, hey, it looked like they had a, uh, it looked like they had this situation. Uh, patroller offered assistance, uh, patient declined. So that's another form that is important, a first aid refusal form. Again, this is a form that we're not using. That's a mixed one that with the check boxes. We don't use it, it's in the book. However, things that we do do, if a patient's in the first aid room, we do record vitals, pulse, blood pressure, respiration. I don't know that we've done much temperature taking there. Oxygen saturation. Uh, we've got some really kind of neat gadgets you just snap over the finger. Pulse ox, it tells you your respiration rate, uh, your, which I mean, your, not respiration rate, I'm sorry, your heart rate, and it gives you a degree of oxygen saturation. Now in town, I typically read 97, 98%. Up of the hill, I'm in the lower 90s. I know the book says under 94 is an issue, but again, you're typically gonna see readings uh, that are in the low 90s just at, at the hill. Level of consciousness. These are things that we have on our, on our records that we, the, the vital records that we have in the first aid room. Again, Tony, did I miss anything? No, but when, when they're talking about taking temperatures and, and with the new COVID-19 protocols, that's gonna be one that you're going to need to assess is somebody's temperature. Um, that'll be done in, in FAR at base medical. So that's gonna be one of the things that you're going to uh, make sure that you document that what their temperature was. You know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I wasn't even thinking. Here at our house, we've got a non-contact thermometer. I picked it up online for very little money. And when people come in, we and we don't have many, we do do take their temperature. So you're right. The, the world has changed thanks to COVID. I think I mentioned at the beginning, if it isn't documented, it didn't happen. I think Riz gave you everything. We talked about the statements, the patient, mechanism of injury, vital signs, and anything else that'll help you renew, review the documents. Now, the statement here is include taking photographs or making diagrams if appropriate. <coughs> now, to the best of my knowledge, as patrollers, we do not take photographs. If there's a serious injury, something involving a lift, something where the area could be liable, on the radio, we ask for a management representative to come. They will come, they will take pictures. We don't do it. Uh, I don't know that we've ever made diagrams again. They do this as the incident investigation team. And that, that goes for taking, <clears throat> there's a lot of times there's some cool stuff that happens during an, an incident. And the, the want to be able to document it for yourself, don't get sucked into taking pictures uh, and then posting those. Um, I, I don't know what the Hills policy, if they've come out with a former one, but I know from the, working in the fire service, we just, we had a class that was put on by the lawyers. Basically they told us all the photos on our phones were owned by the city of Las Vegas. And the minute we took a picture of something that, uh, and it was on our phone, that gave them the right to take our phones away and take all the pictures that were in the phone with them. So to save yourself that headache, um, after, after, the, after the call's done and you guys, you know, you wanna take a picture of anything but the patient, um, but anything that has to do with a patient being in the photo um, and then posting it on social media for later is a big no-no. Okay. I think we can just summarize 
don't do it, right? Yeah, don't do it. Common sense. All right. All right. I think the bottom line here, if, if a legal consequence occurs, you may need to accurately reconstruct what happened. That's from the report. Uh, and again, the time you bring management in is if, uh, again, uh, for instance, a collision with a snowmobile or just, just something beyond a normal, uh, somebody went over a jump and uh, got hurt. Okay, the in incident investigation team. This is management, not us. But again, we would call for management, managed representative. They come up, they take over the investigation. If they ask us to do something, we assist them, but they're in charge. And I'm just flipping through what you've got in your, in your book. Good report writing. Well-written communication doesn't simply happen. Uh, you, you've got to really work at it. More acronyms. There we go. Factual. OEC. Facts. Only information is true and can be documented. Accurate. Describe what you saw, heard, and did correctly. Complete. Include all the relevant information. Terms. Use only accepted medical terms and abbreviations. Unbiased. Don't be subjective. Avoid slang. Uh, legible and legal. Re report should be in clear, easy to read language, black or blue ink. I recommend you carry a couple pens, a couple ballpoint pens, because believe me, sometimes you'll find they don't work. Organized. Try and be uh, present the information in a logical manner. Error-free, checked, and proofread it. Now, again, we're using the, uh, the uh, incident report that you see, uh, patroller, but there is patroller comments where you need more space than would be on that form, and that's where the factual and OEC comes in. I mentioned for correcting, uh, as you're seeing in the picture, single line, initial, date, time. That's it. Oh, if you need to add information, uh, I, I forgot to mention this, and this will happen, believe me. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you say, oh, I forgot, I forgot to add this in there. You use a separate sheet of paper, write the information out clearly, date it, and sign it. Now, the closer that that time is to the instant, the better. You know, all of a sudden, you remember something two weeks later, when you get into court, there could be some issues. And again, we keep mentioning court. I hate to say it, but it does happen. Now we're going to talk about essential communication as we do a handoff. It's important that you provide an accurate picture. What will happen if we do a 911 call, we will get the uh, rescue ambulance in and they will, they will be the typically the first ambulance on scene. The, the city ambulance, you're looking at typically 45 minutes to an hour. If there's a helicopter, it takes a while to get here. We need a way to get the patient to a safe spot for the helicopter to pick them up. So, they, so we, need to tell, we need to tell rescue exactly what's going on. Shouldn't take very long, should take about a minute or less. Again, same information when we're transferring agent sex, chief complaint, history, past medical, physical exam, general impression, treatment, response to treatment. I'm not going to read you the slide. You can, I think you can see it here. Age and sex, chief complaint, history, past medical, physical exam, general impression. Treatment, put them in a sling, we gave them oxygen, whatever, whatever it is. It's just a quick handoff report. Ready? All right, yeah, let's get started with uh, Airways. And uh, Bob Rizzo, please jump in if there's anything you'd like to add at any point. And so, Airway management. We talked about this quite a bit in assessments. Um, we talked a lot about scenarios just because y'all had so many questions where, uh, you know, someone's found down and with C-spine, we talked about a lot of that management. 
Um, and we touched on this as well. So now we're gonna really build out a sort of how to manage an airway when certain interventions are warranted and uh, what that looks like on your end. Um, so if anyone has difficulties with their airway, protecting someone's airway so they don't develop difficulties, that's what we're gonna be talking here very broadly. Uh, these are the chapter's objectives in more detail. Uh, we'll talk about the epiglottis, which is part of the airway anatomy. Uh, we'll describe the mechanism of breathing, like muscles, bones involved. Uh, we'll demonstrate how to open an airway. So this is important stuff that we'll actually be using in the field. Uh, these are the actually ways that you'll uh, deal with someone's airway. Uh, we're going to demonstrate ways to clear airways. So that's going to be like suctioning or using tools to remove things from the airway. Uh, we'll demonstrate the recovery position, which you'll see relates to the protection of someone's airway. Uh, we'll describe different uh, plastic insertions you can use to keep someone's airway open. Uh, talk about delivering oxygen uh, through a face shield or pocket mask. This is about as far as we're going to get today, 9-7. Uh, uh, we're going to do half today and half next class on the airway chapter. So we'll be going down to uh, just all the interventions. We're not going to talk about oxygen use today. All right, this is some vocabulary that I encourage you to go back and review on your own time. We're going to talk about each of these briefly. It'll be up to you to kind of learn these terms and uh, really build them into your vocabulary, get comfortable with them. All right, so we don't need to be told this. Having an open airway and adequate breathing are crucial for survival. That does not need to be stated. Uh, so our goal is to, when we come upon someone, this is the first part of our ABCs. It's airway, breathing, then circulation. So everyone that you come upon, uh, you need to immediately sort of have an idea. How is their airway? How is their breathing? And if there are any issues, you address those immediately. Uh, we talked about there are situations where you switch with C, A, B. You do circulation first, then you do airway breathing. If there's massive bleeding or something, in most cases, you're going to address airway and breathing uh, before you do anything else. If there's a problem, you go and correct it right away. If someone's having issues breathing, you do not continue your assessment. You deal with the issues breathing immediately. And that's the interventions that we're going to be talking about here are ways to deal with issues breathing. Uh, and then, of course, you can, if you need to remove something from the airway, you can do that. If you need to give some oxygen, you can do that. Uh, and if you need to even give some positive pressure, like with the squeezy, um, we call it an ambu bag or a BVM, uh, you can always give uh, oxygen through that as well. All right, so some brief anatomy and physiology. You don't really need to know all of these terms in detail. Uh, I would encourage you to look back at it. Um, but knowing that the epiglottis, because it is focused on by this chapter, is this, this little piece of tissue here that separates uh, the trachea from the esophagus. Uh, that is a place where objects can be lodged. That's some of the utility that this has. Uh, you can have foreign bodies get stuck in this area. Um, and you also, this is where you pass an endotracheal tube. Um, so if someone is intubated, it will go here past the epiglottis, which allows that person to have air delivered directly to the airway. Uh, so useful thing to know about on the mountain, you're not really going to hear about epiglottises. Uh, it's going to be uh, more focused on care than on the anatomy of the airway. Uh, everything we're talking about here is the upper airway, though. So if you hear about an upper airway obstruction, uh, then that's going to be in up to the epiglottis. Uh, once you hit the epiglottis and go below that, you're going to have the lower airway. I have a question. Hello? Yes, please. Right, um, the epiglottis um, opens uh, to going up towards the, the upper airway or going down, going uh, the lower airway, towards the lower Yeah, airway. so it, it's actually the, it's the division point between the airways. So everything above the epiglottis is the upper airway. Everything below it is the lower airway. So if you, hear, uh, if you hear that someone has an upper airway obstruction or they have trauma to their upper airway, that would be anything in this area of the face, the mouth, the nose, above the epiglottis. Um, and then the epiglottis that. is, yeah, okay. It, it's, it's more, my question is more, if, if this was the epiglottis in your, 
here. Does he open this way or he open that way? Oh, I see. Okay, uh, it kind of, it's like a flap that, uh, you can see my camera, right? It's no. kind of up. Oh, okay. Let me search you one sec. So you know what a clapper it's... valve is, David? I'm sorry? You know what a clapper valve is? Yes. Oh. No. Well, it's it, up. It, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So that's basically what your epiglottis is. It's a clapper valve. It's, it stays up and then it flops down. Uh, up and down. Yeah. Okay. To keep it simple. Okay. And so so what? when you're going to introduce that, that device so that we're going to talk later to in, inside of the, through the mouth, uh, there's no risk to, you touch the epiglottis, you go further down than the epiglottis because it's at the level of the ear. So you don't get to the epiglottis basically. No. Okay. Good. Right. Just, we should not with our airways. Okay. Okay, good. That's it. That was the question in a way. Okay. All right. All right, we talked about this. So epiglottis again. Uh, when swallowing, it closes. That's when it flaps down, David. Uh, keeps uh, liquids out of your airway. It keeps food out of your airway. All right, and then this is the lower airway. So if you hear of injuries, trauma, obstructions in the lower airway, we're talking trachea, uh, the bronchi here, and the lungs. So this is all your lower airway. All right, respiration is the act of breathing, uh, just a medical term that you will probably hear. Uh, if you say the respirations for a patient are 16 per minute, uh, that means they're breathing 16 times every minute. So respiration is a word you should be comfortable with a year in medicine. Uh, and then of course, oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. And if you can't get oxygen in and you can't get carbon dioxide out, either one will cause problems. All right, inhalation. Uh, so this is going to be uh, just the muscles in the rib cage and the diaphragm are going to pull air in. And then when you relax, exhalation is the pushing of that air out. So when you go back to our picture here, uh, it's all the muscles between the ribs and then mostly the diaphragm that are gonna be responsible for pulling air in. And then when you just kind of relax those muscles, they go back to just uh, squeezing the air out of the lungs. Uh, if you have injuries to these muscles, this is the utility of this. Injuries to the chest wall can make it difficult to breathe. Injuries to the diaphragm especially can make it difficult to breathe. And that's because the muscles and these bones are what are kind of moving that rib cage. They're helping it expand and that gets the air into the lungs. So any damage to the rib cage, damage to these muscles, damage to the diaphragm or the nerves of the diaphragm are all going to make it difficult to breathe. So when, you, when you're doing your patient assessments, it's important that you know the anatomy of, say, we're dealing with airway of the chest. So, you know, what interrupted the respiratory process? Yep, you could have... Uh, you could have bone fractures, you could have muscle issues, you could have nerve issues, and, and yes, and anything in this area, you kind of want to wonder what's going on so you can treat it appropriately. All right, airway management. So I added in some scenarios to try and like ground this in reality a little bit. So if you were called to the patio area for an older man who collapsed, you just hear that from a bystander. Uh, you arrive to find a middle-aged man lying on his back. Assume the scene is safe here at the patio area at Lee Canyon. There are people standing around. Uh, what do you do next? I thought this would be a good chance to just practice briefly our primary assessments. Uh, does anyone want to volunteer to take a shot at this? How about the ABCD thing? Go ahead, Kelly. Yes. So Go ahead. So you want to do what, Kelly? So you would check the airway. Then okay. you would check his breathing pulse. Mm -hmm. All that circulation, um, and then I—I I guess the D. I—I I, I guess D would be if you possibly see that he has some sort of a. It was I, I forget what D was again. D. D if, if something is broken, I think. Yeah, if something. Yeah, dis. It's disability, disability. so it, it's going to be more like a, a neuro in neuro injury. Uh, yeah, or C-spine. So, so Kelly, yeah, what's, so the, wondering what's, if maybe the like to, what's the easiest way to check, check this guy's, if he's breathing or not? 
What's, what's the easiest way to find out? Oh, probably put like your face right by his mouth or check his pulse. Well, look at Excuse me, sir, are you okay? Or talk, talk, I guess, yeah, that'd be the easiest way. Talk to him. <laughs> exactly. So when you, when you first come up on somebody in this position, you, uh, you know, my, for me, natu my natural instinct is either is to, is to reach for their wrist, to feel for a pulse, but at the same time, a little tug or my hand on their shoulder. Sir, are you okay? Are you all right? Yeah. And, and now if he can say, yeah, I think I just kind of fell over. Well, if he's talking to me. So now I can, Fine. I have a, pri I can start a little primary assessment there. So don't forget to just to keep it simple. Yeah. Okay. Hey, are you okay? Shake and shout. <laughs> Good. All right. So that's that's pretty much what we covered here. You do want to start with your um, avpu if you want to get uh, technical with it. But yeah, just shake and shout or say, hey, how awake are you? What's going on? Just see if this person is awake. Uh, so we're going to say that on the avpu scale, this person is going to moan in response to a trap squeeze. So you walk up and you say, hey, you get nothing. You kind of try and get a little bit louder. You get nothing. So you try and give them a little uh, stimulus by squeezing their shoulder and maybe they moan a little bit, uh, and then you move on to your ABCDs, like you said. So we'll say that his airway is clear for bodies and secretions from looking at it. You always want to inspect an airway. That's part of this. Uh, he's breathing slowly, and we'll say that he's snoring loudly. Uh, so you all know what it sounds like to snore. Uh, that is an issue you see a good deal in EMS. Um, it, it means they're not getting quite enough air. And we'll say that you take a carotid pulse. He has a normal rate, rhythm, and quality, so his pulse is okay. So what is this man's most immediate problem that needs to be corrected? Anyone? Uh, it's position. Position, uh, let's see. Well, I don't know that there's anything terrible about lying on your back. You could survive that. Uh, Maybe lack of oxygen. What if there's an issue with it, what do you want to correct immediately? Yes. You want to watch out for a lack of oxygen. If someone has snoring respirations, if you feel like there is a possible obstruction that's making their breathing sound kind of weird, you want to address that immediately, right? And snoring counts. Uh, so what can we do about it? Has anyone read this far into the chapter? Yeah, we can. Uh, so what we can do is to open his, uh, his mouth doing the clinch. And then uh, we can uh, sweep it in, into the mouth with a finger just to make sure that the, you put back the tongue uh, against the palate. Or the, you, you put back the tongue in, his, it's in the, the best position possible so he can breathe properly. Okay, you're definitely on the right track. Uh, the finger sweep is going to be more for foreign bodies. Like if you think there's a piece of food in there or like some small object, that might help you get it out. If you're worried about the tongue, which you're correct, the tongue is going to be what causes these snoring respirations. If you look at this picture here, the tongue is a big, heavy muscle. And when someone is unresponsive and on their back, it can fall into the airway and keep air from making it into the trachea. So and what so what we can do about that. Yes, exactly. So that's we're going to talk about some airway. So yes, how perfect. do you do that? So, we need, we need to move his head by uh, grabbing the chin and the, 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 forehead, yeah. the, the head and just move him up like that so you can open the airway. Head, tilt, head, head tilt, chin left? Yes. Yeah, tilt That's head. one way. What's the other if we're concerned that he has a C-spine problem? Jaw thrust. Jaw thrust, good. Jaw thrust, yeah. Perfect. He's just yep. opening his jaw, basically. Not moving the head. Perfect. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, this is the first maneuver that they talk about is, uh, you mentioned it briefly, David, you can use the scissors to open the mouth to inspect it if you'd like. If you suspect that there's something wrong inside the mouth, uh, you can go ahead and open it and look around. Be very careful putting your fingers inside of anyone's mouth. There's always the possibility that they will bite you if they wake up or for some reason they get startled. Uh, so be very careful putting your fingers around anyone's mouth. Uh, but you can pull them very quickly out if they're not too far in. You just use the fingertips like in this picture. Uh, so you do that. You see that the airway is clear of foreign body secretions. Uh, and then we're going to talk about opening the airway, which is what you all mentioned. First one is your head tilt chin lift. 
Uh, so can you use this on someone who has a suspected C-spine injury? Can you use a head tilt chin lift on them? No. No, why not, David? Well, you don't want to move his uh, cervical. So like, like we said before, it would be just to open his, um, his mouth, basically. Perfect, right. So, so this moves the cervical spine too much for someone with suspected trauma. Uh, but if you do not suspect trauma, you think this is medical. I mean, if this man was found on the patio of Lee Canyon, his family says, oh, he got woozy in his chair and we helped him to the ground. He doesn't have trauma. He's just passed out. So this would be an option for you if you do not suspect trauma. Uh, and as you can see here, you just put a hand on the forehead. You kind of push back and down. You put a hand on the chin. You kind of lift up. And it's like you're helping that person sniff for a brush of fret there. Their, no, their nose kind of comes up and uh, it looks like they're kind of sniffing the air the way you position their head. That will pull the muscle of the tongue, just the way that you manipulate the airway like that. It's going to help pull the muscle of the tongue out of the airway and it'll allow them to move their air uh, okay without being obstructed. All right. The second one that we mentioned, if you have C-spine, is the jaw thrust. This one takes a little getting used to. Uh, this is one of those things, if you have someone to practice on, it would be a good idea. Um, you take your thumbs and you put them kind of right on the cheekbones, like those zygomatic arches right here. You put your thumbs on the cheekbones. And then I can't really do it on myself. And then you put the fingers on the edge of the jaw right here, right on the angle. So you put your thumbs on the cheekbones fingers on the angle of the jaw and you just pull the whole jaw forward. And again, that does the same thing. It pulls the muscle of the tongue out of the back of the throat and that's going to allow this person to breathe without obstruction. And you do not have to move the C-spine with this. So that allows them to uh, not have their C-spine moved if you think it might be broken. All right. All right, clearing the airway. Another one, so you're called to the patio for an older man who collapsed. This time you arrive to find a middle-aged man lying crumpled on his side. The scene is safe. What do you do next? Whoops, we won't show that yet. Who wants to try this one? Amber, what do you say? You go and say, try to speak to him verbally. Um, and see if they'll respond. If they don't, look for airway. You might be able to put your hand by their mouth. And if they don't respond that way and they're not breathing, then you need to move them onto their back. Look in their airway. Check to see if it's clear. OK. Very good. So we're going to address first their awareness. We're going to walk up and say, hey, can you hear me? Are you awake? And then uh, if you get no response there, check the airway, check the breathing, and check the circulation as well. So I'll say again, this man uh, moans in response to a trap squeeze. You see bloody secretions in the mouth, uh, bleeding, it, uh, breathing slowly, and he's making a gurgling noise uh, with each breath. Uh, so anyone, what do you all think could happen if this problem is not corrected? If you allow someone to uh, have bloody secretions in their mouth, um, what could happen as time goes on? Any guesses? It might actually drown with its own blood. So that's... Okay. Maybe the diaphragm? Something wrong with the diaphragm? I okay. Think, I think he can choke himself because now he's, bloody, he's got blood in his mouth. So... Hmm. You have to, to begin to try to extract that blood uh, uh, so he can breathe properly. Is, is he in a good position right now if he has the blood secretions in his mouth and he's making gurgling noises? It, it's pretty good, actually, yes. Why? Because he, he's got his mouth on the side. So if he opens his mouth, he, 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 can, he can go out yeah. in a way. So, gra so gravity is working for us right here, right? Because he's, he's on his side. Gravity wants to bring, the, so what would it be most people's reaction or, or what would they would most likely want to do in this position, seeing somebody in this position? They would want to, 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 to pull him onto his back. 
Okay. And that's, that would be a bad thing because now if he's, if he's got bleeding secretions in his mouth, now, like you said, it's going to start going down. It's going to cause further obstruction. Blood doesn't go well in the gut. So that can cause him to vomit, which is going to add more to your problem. So what, what piece of equipment do we need here? What just, if, if he, can, can you can you move him if he doesn't have a if we don't suspect he's got a spinal injury can we move him into a, a that side way position but with where he has his arm he can rest his head against his arm and just put him to begin comfortable? Yes. We, yes we can leave him like this <clears throat> but if we're going to roll him over what piece of equipment should we have with us suction oh. suction oh yeah uh, to roll him over, we will have to, we will need the, the suction pump. No, you don't want to put him on his back unless you had the ability to suction, and you still would like want suction with him in this position so you could clear the air, clear the the uh, secretions out of it. Okay. Perfect. So yeah, to recap, that was a good discussion. We have an issue where we don't know where bloody secretions are coming from we're to assume that they're going to keep coming which means if this person uh even in this position they could be at risk of inhaling or aspirating those or swallowing it which irritates the stomach uh, and they could start to vomit which would make things way worse um and so if you especially rolled them on their back you might have an issue as well and you need to correct uh, that flow of those bloody secretions before you consider uh maybe repositioning this patient uh, so we are talking about clearing the airway now. Uh, so there are a few things you can do. If you're worried about debris, uh, you can do a finger sweep. If you're worried about more liquids, you can do suction. Uh, gravity and positioning are your friend. In a lot of situations, you'll be able to use that. Just like here, we were talking about, this is a pretty good position for this patient already. If they have secretions in their mouth, if you have no reason to move there, and then the abdominal thrust or the Heimlich maneuver is to clear uh, something actually obstructing the throat. All right, so the finger sweep. This one is indicated, look at the all caps, only for patients who are unresponsive when a foreign body is seen in the mouth. So there are a lot of really um, strong qualifiers here. You only use this for someone who you are certain will not wake up uh, because they could bite your finger. Uh, and you're only going to use it if you see something in the mouth. You don't want to go digging in someone's airway on a hunch that there is something in there. Um, if you see something and you want to pull it out, that's when this is appropriate. Uh, you don't want to just say, oh, this person's passed out in a steakhouse, so there's probably steak in there. I'm going to stick my hand down their mouth. That's not really what this is for. And a question for everyone. How do you know if someone is full on unresponsive and if this is a safe maneuver? Maybe even after you do the shoulder, you know, after you just talk, try to talk to them and you, they're not responding verbally, but you also do the pinch of the, that shoulder of your muscle there and they're still not responding with pain. Yeah, no, that's very good. So you're going down the AVPU, you go from alert to verbal to pain. If they don't respond to pain, you're now at full on unresponsive. So that, that is the best sort of a proxy you have, but I, I would leave a little bit of doubt in your mind always and just think you can never really know if someone is fully out of it and is not going to react to you shoving your finger in their mouth. So keep that in mind because it's kind of a dangerous thing to do. You want to look out for yourself. Personal safety is important in EMS. So if you're going to stick your hand in someone's mouth, you always want to be very careful. You can put something else in there like an OPA um, to make sure that if they do bite down, they won't get your finger. It's like a bite block so that they can't actually get you. Um, I would recommend doing something like that if you're going to put your hand in someone's mouth because uh, it always comes with a little bit of a risk there. So even if you're, that's a great way to go, Avpu, uh, squeeze them for pain, see if they react. Even if they don't though, uh, go with a little bit of caution. And they say here, do not do a blind finger sweep uh, by inserting your finger farther than you can see. Again, this is not for hunches, like, oh, I think there might be something down there. You're not going for stuff you cannot. 
Uh, what's more pertinent and what we're going to use quite a bit more is going to be suctioning. Uh, this is going to be things for like blood or vomit, which you will see up at the mountain. A lot of drunk people end up vomiting. A lot of people who have trauma end up bleeding in their mouth. Uh, so this is going to be much more relevant uh, versus the finger sweep. So we have two types. Uh, we have this manually operated one in our packs at Lee Canyon. It's in the trauma pack. Uh, you do have to call for it. Uh, and it will come down with a patroller. So if you really need to suction something, you can use this manual suction on the hill. Uh, otherwise, we have the pump, like more powerful suction, this one right here, uh, down at the first aid station. And again, I have a question for everyone. So say that someone is actively vomiting uh, and their worst case scenario, like we were saying earlier, they're lying on their back and they start actively vomiting uh, do you think this suction is going to be enough to keep them from maybe getting that vomit in their lungs and from being a problem for them? Do you think this suction would be enough to do that job? No, uh, probably not. It's better to use gravity to your advantage. Gravity. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, that's what I was getting at here. So you cannot count on this to do all the suction for you. You cannot count on this to clear the mouth of secretions entirely if someone has a ton of secretions, if they're actively vomiting, this is not enough. This is enough to clear out some secretions after someone has vomited or if they're bleeding from their mouth at a, a relatively uh, brisk rate, you could maybe deal with that. But if someone is vomiting a lot, uh, this is not nearly enough. So that is where gravity comes in and that's your most important tool. Uh, you just need that recovery position like we mentioned earlier, we'll get to that as well. That's gonna be your best friend. But this does work pretty well. I mean, if you have a, a decent amount of secretions, this is pretty powerful suction. It works relatively well. All right. These are just the different types of suction tips. Uh, we have this rigid suction catheter with the curved tip is called a Yankauer. Uh, that's probably the most common type you're gonna see. And then a flexible one that's a little gentler that can be used in the nose. That's uh, gonna be rare. Uh, so yeah, if you hear someone ask for a Yankauer, uh, that's what they're talking about here. It's the suction tip. That's just what we call the shape of this suction. Uh, and that's the most commonly used from what I have seen. Uh, it has a hole right here that you cover with your thumb. So we'll go through the whole skill of this that lay out here. Uh, and then y'all will get to practice uh, in person at some point. But there's a little hole here where the thumb is. And there's another hole at the tip. And the suction won't actually make it to the tip until you cover this hole with your thumb. So that allows you to determine uh, without any like fancy switch on the suction cell, you can decide when the suction is on and off just by moving your thumb right here. Uh, and that is helpful because it, it lets you suction when you want to. And we'll talk about the proper way to suction uh, in a minute here. And then this is the flexible one. Again, you can use it for like narrow areas like the, uh, the nose, um, less commonly used. All right, can also suction a stoma, which if y'all know uh, someone who's had like uh, a hole put in their throat because they have some sort of cancer or for other reasons, that's called a stoma. And if you're dealing with something like that, they can be kind of delicate. So maybe a smaller suction tip that's a little more uh, bendy and pliable would be the thing to use there. All right, rigid suction catheters that yank hour are used more, option, uh, more often. They can remove large volumes of debris rapidly. All right, so this is talking about how to actually suction, uh, if possible, pre-oxygenate the patient. Uh, that just means suctioning is going to deprive a patient of air because you are literally sucking the air out of their mouth. Uh, so you want to be conscious of that. You want to not do it for too long, and you want to make sure that they have relatively good oxygen going into that if you can. So if you can give them some oxygen, uh, if they're struggling, it's a good thing to give them oxygen before you suction. Uh, sometimes that's not possible. I mean, if it's urgent and it's a traumatic situation, you're probably not going to bother hooking up the oxygen before suctioning. Uh, but it's just something to keep in your mind that what you do with the suction does affect how much oxygen the patient is getting. It's important to keep that in mind. All right. And you need to be careful with uh, where you put the catheter because it, it is rigid plastic. Airways are soft tissue. It's easy to damage someone's vocal cords. It's easy to damage someone's voice box. 
um, it, it's relatively delicate inside the airway. So you need to be careful with that rigid suction. You can't just ram that down the back of someone's throat. You need to know where you're going and you need to go gently and, and cautiously. Uh, it's also easy to initiate a gag reflex. You know how it feels to have something stuck down the back of your throat. It's not pleasant. It can make someone vomit. So you need to be conscious of that. And there's kind of a balance sometimes if you're trying to suction someone's airway and they start gagging and you have to decide, is it really worth it to push this person to the point where they're going to vomit and create more problems for both of us? Like, do I really need to suction their airway more than I already have? You need to keep that in mind as well, because you could end up creating a problem for yourself. Uh, so you need to be careful uh, with how much you use suction. And if there's a foreign body, you might push it further in. So again, you want to be able to see where your catheter is. You don't want to just be blindly using this in someone's airway. This is dangerous because you don't know what you're doing back there. All right, so actually we have a skill right here. This is uh, describing how, but I put the skill section right here. Actually, no, I didn't, so we'll do this. Uh, so with a side to side, Circular motion, what they mean. Yeah, go ahead, question. Oh, is that just a, okay, cough or something. What this basically is saying is the important part is you put the suction catheter in the airway, you cover the hole with your thumb, which turns the suction on. Now it's actually sucking debris out of the airway. And then you kind of sweep the airway as you pull the suction catheter out. It's kind of like a vacuum. You want to sweep it around so you get good coverage. You want to be pulling it out so that you continue to pull stuff out of the airway. And you want to have your thumb over that hole. So you have your thumb off the hole. You insert it into the airway. You put your thumb on the hole. And then you sweep it back and forth and you pull it out of the airway and try to get as much as you can out of there. Again, you should always be able to see what you're doing so you don't damage any tissue. Are there any questions about how to suction? Like I said, that's one of those things you need to practice and kind of have in your hands, but does that make sense generally? Does anyone want to pause there? Okay. Uh, you want to apply suction for no more than 10 to 15 seconds because you don't want to deprive the person of air uh, for too long. Uh, that's 10 to 15 seconds in an adult. Children, uh, no more than five to 10 seconds. So just be conscious when you're doing suction, you're sucking air out of the airway. So you need to think I'm depriving this person of air. I can't do this forever. You get a set amount of time on that and you need to be done. All right. Uh, large pieces of debris can plug the tip of the catheter. Um, so you just want to maybe uh, material sticking to the end, you can pull it out and kind of clean it off on something. Uh, make sure that you have in mind that's going back in their airway. So you want to use something sterile if you're going to clean it off. You can use a clean glove. You can use a trauma dressing, but don't just stick it. Don't wipe it on the ground and then put it back in someone's mouth. So you want to be cautious of that. Uh, and then each time you put the catheter in, uncover the thumb hole. We talked about that. All right. Uh, we talked about this with active oral bleeding or repeated vomiting. Uh, it may be necessary to use gravity. Uh, as well as suction. Uh, that may be the only way to deal with the amount of fluid that you're working with. And then uh, if you can report to the people down the chain what came out, uh, that's very helpful. If you say we suctioned out uh, maybe a few hundred cc's of blood, then the ambulance personnel kind of have an idea of what they're dealing with. They have some trauma to the airway. Uh, if you say you suctioned out uh, several hundreds of vomit. They know that this patient is actively vomiting. That's important for them too. Uh, so knowing what you're pulling out of the airway uh, can help people down the chain sort of direct their care and make sure they don't uh, miss out on something for the patient. All right. And then of course, every medical uh, piece of equipment needs to be thoroughly cleaned, disinfected, or replaced if it's disposable. Uh, so if you use suction on someone, uh, you need to either send it to be clean, or if it's a disposable piece, you just toss it, it won't be used again. And it, it is helpful if uh, we have the suction down at FAR, if you use it, uh, replace the catheter uh, so that it's ready to go for the next person. You don't want the next person, if they need suction, they don't want to be hunting around for the catheter, for the, the tip. 
you should replace that for them so they don't find themselves in that position where they urgently need suction, but there's no catheter on it. So you want to make sure it's set up to go restock it for the next person. All right. We actually talked about this already. Y'all got ahead of me. You anticipated this one. This is good. I was just going to talk about, um, you know, suctioning on the side versus on the back and what's safest for managing large volumes of fluid. Uh, and y'all got on top of that. I was actually going to ask a question about that. So, and this might be kind of a yeah, silly please. question, but if, if someone is kind of lying this way, can you use suction and gravity to help you at the same time? Or would that be something that you have them sit up or lay on their back and then use the suction or? Yeah, do you mean lying this way? Yes, the, the gentleman here that you just showed us. Yeah, so I would say, um, unless there is a reason to move them right away, like say you come on someone who is actively vomiting in this position, unless you have a reason to move them right away, uh, you don't need to because it's going to help. Gravity is in your favor here. They can vomit without that getting back in their airway. So that's perfect. You can suction them while they're in this position as well. You have enough access. Uh, so this is an okay position to manage that person in. Yes. Um, that you may, may need to move them for transport. Uh, if you need to do spinal precautions or something, it may be, it may get a little trickier if you have other reasons that make you need to move this person into a supine position. Uh, but even then, you can always go back to, if someone's on a backboard, you can tilt the backboard. You can use gravity in that way uh, to get back to helping you. So usually, it's not going to be that complicated. But even if it gets complicated, you can still find a way to use gravity in those situations. Did you have more on that? I'm not sure. I maybe got a little No, no, that, that was answer. perfect. That was, that was exactly what I was asking. Just um, if someone is in this position, can you use mm -hmm. both things to help? That's that. No, you yeah. answer that perfectly. Thank you. Yeah, you you definitely should. And, and I mean, usually you can do it with just gravity. Like if you if you have a drunk friend, um, you know, you want to put them on their side, right? You don't have suction catheters at home. Like often, gravity is enough to handle a lot of these situations. Of course, we're medical professionals, so we have a higher standard than just um, okay, you're fine, you can lie there. Uh, so you want to be ready with that suction, you want to be anticipating, but oftentimes this, this first uh, intervention of just having them in the recovery position, that might be enough. Okay, so we'll keep going here. Uh, gravity and positioning, I think we've talked a good deal about this. Uh, and then it says at the bottom here, you can, this is not just for unconscious people who are lying on the ground. Sometimes people need to be instructed if they're going to vomit. Um, or if they have a nosebleed. Sometimes people are kind of dazed, you know, if they're sick or they've had trauma, um, they might need some help remembering to like sit forward to make sure that they don't end up choking on something or swallowing a bunch of blood. Especially people with nosebleeds, actually, you don't want to let them swallow their blood. And sometimes they don't seem to have a problem with it until it starts to really hurt their stomach. So you want to make sure if you see secretions, blood, vomit coming out of someone's mouth, help them take a position that gets that out rather than back into their mouth, back into their airway. Uh, so always just be aware of how you can easily use gravity to help uh, get, get that out of there. All right, uh, so we talked about this. If the patient is unresponsive, will the patient into the recovery position? In the presence of a suspected spinal injury, we talked about this about uh, a bit last week, uh, you can roll someone onto their side while you maintain the head and neck in a neutral position. So you can protect C-spine and also roll someone into recovery position. Or you could uh, put a C-collar on and then move them into recovery position. Uh, so this is an option if you suspect a C-spine injury. Not necessarily a full spinal injury, that would be uh, recovery position would be too much manipulation for that. But if it's just cervical spine you're worried about, you can have two people work in coordination. One holds the head, one rolls the body uh, to move them into recovery position while protecting their neck. You can't, that is an option. Uh, and then we're gonna get into foreign materials wedged in the mouth. Gravity may not work there. Oh, and here's our little suctioning tutorial. So suction on, make sure that you're not gonna go too far back into the airway, know where you're going. 
Okay, open the mouth using the cross finger technique. They say uh, insert the catheter to the predetermined depth. That just means know how deep you're going in. You can't just be going in blindly, causing possible airway trauma. Apply in a circular motion as you withdraw, covering that uh, air hole as you withdraw. All right, I'm gonna talk about abdominal thrust and we're almost through this section. We'll get into the general review. Uh, so this is our last bit of topic, uh, just the Heimlich maneuver. I'm sure we've all uh, heard of the Heimlich or I would guess most of us have uh, a way to uh, dislodge a foreign body immediately after someone begins choking. This is for uh, people older than one year. So basically you don't use this on babies. You don't use it on infants. Uh, you can use it on toddlers, you can use it on children, you can use it on teenagers, on adults, uh, just not infants, not little babies uh, in diapers. You don't use this on them. Uh, it's pretty clear. I think people are pretty good about giving a universal sign for choking. I don't know how that works, but there is something in our brains that just knows how to tell people we are choking, uh, and they'll usually look like this or very panicked. Um, and they'll be kind of frantically gesturing for help. So I would hope that uh, we've maybe tried this. I know high schools teach this these days. Uh, maybe you've had some first aid classes where they go over this. Uh, we'll go over the positioning the anatomy, but the basic process is going to be stand behind. Uh, the patient can be standing or sitting. You just need to be behind their torso here. Uh, you grasp your fist, so you make a fist and then you put your other hand over it, and you give firm upward thrusts. And the objective here is to hit the diaphragm muscle. I'll show you a picture in a moment. And you keep doing this until that comes out or the patient becomes unresponsive. We'll go back to that in a minute. But right here is where you want the fist. This is an, uh, an example of when it's important to understand anatomy. Uh, so what are we really trying to push on in the Heimlich and why? Like, what do you think if the fist goes here and we're trying to push upward with the fist kind of under the rib cage, what are we trying to push on and why? The diaphragm. Right. And why are we trying to push on the diaphragm? Because it's a muscle and it's going to maybe... Dislodge anything in the stomach? Force it up? The air out. Like reverse pressure up. It goes up the... Di up the Trying to force air out of the, out of the lungs. Right, here. perfect. So we're trying to force air. Yes, perfect. So it's a way of squeezing very quickly. If you push on this diaphragm, you're going to rapidly shrink the volume of air in the lungs. You're putting them under pressure. It's like squeezing uh, like a bottle and the cap pops off. Um, you're just trying to compress the lung very quickly. And the way you do that is by pushing on the diaphragm, which is the muscle that expands and compresses the lungs. So if you push on it really fast, you're gonna force a bunch of air out of the trachea and hopefully push that foreign body out of the trachea. That's the idea. Uh, so knowing that the anatomy becomes very important because if you're on the sternum, if you're on the rib cage, uh, this is not going to work. Uh, you might end up breaking the ribs before you get any results here. Uh, you need to be, um, under the rib cage, which allows you to access the diaphragm. And so if, if you feel on yourself, you can feel where your rib cage ends. There's that costal angle that we talked about in anatomy, and it's right up under the rib cage. It's, it's pretty unpleasant if you push on that on yourself. If you push up into your diaphragm, that's exactly where you're going for though. So you would put one fist there, and let's get everyone practice on yourself right now. Take your fist, and this is where you put it on a patient. It's right under the ribs. And then you're gonna to wanna to try and push that fist up and under the rib cage, aiming for the diaphragm, trying to push that, uh, push that air in there. And you get pretty forceful. I mean, you're trying to uh, get results here. You're not worried about hurting the patient. Uh, they'd rather get a little bruised up than, than choke, so be forceful. And what happens, what do you all think happens if the patient becomes unconscious and collapses? What would uh, happen then? What would you do? I am back and start rescue breathing. Yep, fair enough. You can start, uh, so 
if the patient becomes unconscious, they collapse, now they're down on the ground supine, you're going to basically enter the CPR algorithm. Uh, you can quickly take a look in the mouth to see if you can see anything obstructing. It's unlikely because that's far enough down that you probably will not see it. If it's a really big obstruction, maybe you will and you can do a finger sweep and pull it out. Less likely though, what you're really gonna start doing is start doing CPR. Uh, so you're gonna start compressions and breathing. Uh, so we're all gonna get BOS certified. Uh, that's a requirement for being an OEC tech. Uh, that's when you'll learn the CPR algorithm in depth. Uh, but really, if someone collapses because they have air obstruction, that is the same as a cardiovascular collapse. I mean, uh, their heart could have stopped because they weren't getting oxygen. They could have just passed out from the oxygen. But either way, you're going to treat it as the best thing to do for this person is now CPR. So if the Heimlich doesn't work, your person goes unconscious and collapses, you're going to just move to CPR and rescue breathing. All right, and then this is for babies, infants. Uh, you're going to alternate uh, back blows, which is down here, and chest thrusts, which is up here. It's the same thing. You're still aiming for that diaphragm in the baby. Uh, they're just so small that you're going to do it with a few fingers uh, to avoid uh, hurting. Their uh, and you just alternate five and five. So you want to just go ahead and just kind of tap their back. Uh, not too violently, but you're trying to get results. Hopefully gravity kind of helps you here as well. Uh, and then you switch them over and do the chest thrust. And again, if this doesn't work, you go into the, the CPR cycle. All right, here's a finger sweep. All right, basically what you would expect, uh, just use the cross finger technique to open the mouth. Uh, do not go blind. You should be able to see the object. Try and pull it out with the tip of your finger. All right. And let's see. We could, uh, Patty, I'll leave it up to you. We could do OPAs and NPAs, or we could go on to the review section. I don't know what you want to do at this point. Uh, why don't we go on to the review section? Because this is a lot of information. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good call. All right, perfect. Uh, should we take maybe five minute break? Does that sound good to you? Perfect. Can I ask a question real quick? Go ahead. Yeah, and then please, uh, yeah, if we're stopping here, let's do questions. I just wanted one question. You said on the head tilt, chin lift maneuver, not to do that if there's a spinal injury. Did you that's say correct. that? correct. Yes? yes? Yes. You don't, you don't want to do a head lift. So I'm confused because the book the actual book thing says a method used to open the airway when there's a possible cervical spine injury. Are you sure they weren't talking about the jaw thrust? Yeah, I, I I saw it. I, I'm reading it. Yeah, I saw that too today. I'm literally reading it right there. And it says to do it on spinal. So, and then you go down to the jaw one and that says it's primary and doesn't say anything about this. Yeah, so I was just confused. I don't know about that. What uh, page is it? Uh, page 221. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, that doesn't sound right to me. I mean, you want to move the C-spine as little as possible if you suspect trauma, which makes the jaw thrust perfect because you don't move the C-spine at all. You just move the jaw. Uh, that's what I was taught. I, I, I'm i fairly certain that's correct is this is for C-spine trauma and the other one you would not want to use this in C-spine trauma. Um, you want to weigh in too, Rizzo? Yeah, I, I, I agree that the, I think it might be, a, must be a misprint in the book. <clears throat> so. so. So I understand right then the head tilt would be if you suspect no spine, or no, I'm sorry. So you the don't jaw thrust, if you suspect- spinal injury. The other suspect, one you can use for spinal. If you suspect spinal injury, you wanna do the jaw thrust. Okay, and the other one's for not. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah. Thank you, I just wanted to, to clarify that because I- Because yeah, when, you no, the head tilt, you're, you're, when you do the head tilt, you're hyperextending the head and the neck. 
Okay. Yeah, it sounds, it, yeah, I can see the dynamics of it, but when I'm reading it here, I'm like going, hmm. <laughs> So yeah, that that's, if that's right. on a test, if that's on a question that, that the uh, that the OEC puts out on the test bank of tests questions, we'll make sure that we address that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great. Other questions? And actually, we're about to do the the full on review, which will be mostly y'all's time to ask questions and just review what we've gone over. So go ahead and uh, take a break. Think of anything you'd like to go ahead and review, and let's be back. Here. And in five minutes. Okay. Express their consent. Or did you just take implied consent? They're kind of two different uh, like worlds. Okay, perfect. So coming down to the, the answer to this question, number 19. So it would be the B answer. So when someone is asking for help, so that can be considered an express consent. Yes. Like B and E. Perfect. And what about the last one? So yeah, e. it's confusing. E is the same. <laughs> I didn't actually oh. see this question. Uh, what's E? So uh, B, B is a 52-year-old skier who comes to the head room and asks for help. This is definitely um, expressed consent. But then what about a man who asks you to help is unresponsive? Exactly. Exactly. So that's, what, that that's what my question. Oh, okay, also great. Correct. No, that's, that's, that's uh, actually... Implied, that's an implied consent, I would suppose, because the person uh, are responsive is... Yes. This is this is a this is a detail thing. It's the person is asking for help for their friend, right? Not like their kid. Is it their friend? Well, yeah. the wife. The wife. wife. Okay. Okay. She's so. Not a minor. You are, are you talking yeah, so about? She's not a minor. Technically, this person, unless there is no. Oh, go ahead, Patricia. I said you're talking about. Okay. Uh, uh huh. I'm sorry. You're talking about uh, number twenty. No, sorry. The question. No. Question 19. 19. 19. Okay, so on 19, which of the following des descriptions is the best example of express consent? And the answer would be a 52-year-old skier who comes to the aid room and asks for help. So you're a skier, you fall, you do whatever, and you see a patroller or you come into the aid room and you say, can you help me? So that is and express consent. They're asking for help. They're talking to you and asking for it. So is D. So is D. The D is asking on behalf of their wife, correct? Right. Yep. That would be implied the, consent. The idea here is you cannot actually consent. I mean, unless there is no other option, you you should be taking consent from the patient themselves. So like if, if that patient's wife were lying on the ground and and uh, like bleeding out, that patient's husband does not have control over their medical decisions and their ability to give consent. You would act on implied consent for the wife no matter what. The okay. husband might say, I want you to help my wife, and that's great, but flip it and say, what if the husband said, I don't want you to help my wife, I don't consent. He doesn't get to do consent. In that situation, there's no express consent given. It's implied consent on the part of the wife who is on. Yes, but the, the question, uh... Conscious? Number D, a man because who has unconscious, to help you his unresponsive 29-year-old diabetic. Right. He's unresponsive. That's, right. We're saying that's why it's not expressed consent. Exactly. The answer D. Why? It, it can only be A because D is not expressed consent. It's implied. It's B. I'll never be a ski patrol. <laughs> consent on the part of the unconscious one. Now you have no, to you'll be a ski patrol. It just takes time. <laughs> And you have to remember, when a patient is unresponsive... But you shouldn't have to spell it right. That's implied. Yeah. Because you know that if yeah. they were responsive and they were hurt, they would ask for help. That's what you're suggesting. That's what they're suggesting, hopefully. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And this is why we're doing those tests. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> 
There's another one. Uh, let me see. It was one that I could not. What type of content would apply for? No. Let's see. It's not in this one. It's in the, in the second chapter, I think. Okay, so let's go over chapter two. And since David, I have yours. And I'm uh, sure my question, or oh, once uh, some individual choice, uh, one second, I need to look at the questions. Anyone jump in? Doesn't make a difference. Which of the following attribute is not one of the 14 attributes of an effective emergency care system? <laughs> we get again the question, <laughs> which we never get to know what are the 14 attributes. Yeah, exactly. So I had the same question. <laughs> Wait, which question but is it? Public acceptance. Three. It's, it's is it on the, chapter yeah? three? It's uh, question uh, three. Chapter two. Three. Chapter, yeah, chapter yeah. two. Which of the following attributes is not one of the four? <laughs> Fabio is laughing, <laughs> speaking. God. I went oh, on God. the internet and Googled it. And no, David, I have the same question. So, because they never listed on the book the 14 attributes, uh, I have to Google, you know, 14 yeah. attributes. I mean, I'm pretty sure it would be public and acceptance. And I see that that one was the one that was not included. Oh well, yeah, I need to do that. I'm gonna Google it. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure it'd be public acceptance because I mean, yeah, one of the four, or three or three of these look like essentials. But I have another question, which is the following. Uh, so the number four. Uh, so it says, which of the following is not an attribute of an emerging care system? And between those one, uh, I found just equipment that is not listed. Uh, as an attribute, but I don't understand why it's not listed. It's not listed if equipment is in the definition of basically emergency care system. That's a good answer. That, I good. could not find the answer in the book the, uh, for this one either. The answer is A. Yeah, but what I don't understand is why uh, equipment is not in, uh, cannot be is not an attribute. If you look at the definition of emergency care system, it says uh, it's a network uh, that is including, you know, uh, let me try to find it. Give me a second. And it lists. Okay, for number yeah, it four. Says, uh, uh, a network of specially trained person personnel, equipment, facilities, and other resources that responds to medical emergencies. So, I don't know why we is it cannot be an attribute. Interesting. So they said the objective is two to one. The feedback is twenty six to twenty seven. Subject is chapter two. Complexity is easy. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, give me another one. I'll look that one up for you. Thank you. The answer is A, right? The answer is A, A. equipment. And the answer to number three was D, public acceptance. Any others? Uh, yes. Uh, How about number six? No, number eight. Oh, number six. Let's look at six. We see technician meets or exit. The, it's the D. That's right. Everyone agree? Which one? Sorry. Which number question? Six. Number six. Yeah, D. Okay. So. Later on, there is another uh, question. We'll get there, but, but it, it kind of relates to that in terms of the tiers. And I have a question about that, but when we get there. Let, okay, so what's anyone with a question on number seven in chapter two? 
Evan. Moi, tu manges des comme des poils de personne, tu manges des Si. Si. Si is right. How about number eight? Si. I'm sorry, what'd you say? I go for C. C is in, C is in cat? Yeah. Okay. I put B me. You put B? Yeah. Which of the following is not one of the four nationally recognized pre-hospital emergency care provider levels? The one that's not in question seven. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> Very good. The one that is not in it. Oh, shit. We have an emergency res medical responder. <laughs> is it EMR? D? It would, no, it would be C, an outdoor emergency care tech. And number seven is the four recognized levels. So, yeah, correct. One well, that's not in seven is the right answer. Oh, yeah. So, once again, the. the, the a noisy technician is not uh, is not is not recognized as a pre-hospital emergency care. Right. Provider. What what? So what are we uh, then in that scenario? Here, 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 here. Local. Local. Local, not national. Oh, understood. Okay. A noisy uh, an outdoor emergency uh, emergency care technician is a local uh, responder and not a national responder. Okay, good right. to know, thanks. Okay, how about number nine? Chapter two. A. A. A, A as well. Everyone agrees with chapter two? Yeah. With, uh, A? Yeah, well, tier one. Okay. So, um, wouldn't it be tier four? It's A. Okay. Deployed. Okay. So, how about number 10? D. C. 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 It says C. It's C. Who said C? I oh, don't know. <laughs> Would it be D as in David? Yes. Okay, David Worley. <laughs> well, D is, is the correct right answer. Also? Huh? D is the correct answer. Thank you very much. Okay, how about number 11? So, mm -hmm. I, uh, just before we go uh, further, so. A critical care provider who brings advanced life support equipment, therapy, and intervention to the scene are typically deployed in what tier? Well, it's the last one. It's the ambulance, it's the helicopter, etc. So that's the tier four. We all agree. Right. But then tier three is the tier three is why is the AMT? Who wants to look that one up? B. So David, you can look that one up since you sort of disagree. Mm -hmm. so we're going to move to number 11. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, I thought I'd get an answer fast, you know. But, uh, <sighs> okay, give me number 11. The seamless delivery of high quality emergency e. medical care as patients transition from initial contact. E. 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 Why, would you, why would you say it's B? Seamless. That's right, seamless. That magical word. Oh. Number 12. C. C is in Charlie? Yeah. All right. In protocol. So remember that you will have doctors that are on our patrol. So if you're treat when you're treating a patient. Don't say, hey, one of our patrollers is a doctor. They're all the same. Because then people are going to say, hey, I don't want to be treated by you. I would rather be treated by the doctor. So just remember not to do that because we're all the same. Now, if one of the docs want to come over and say, hey, you know, 
put their, uh, their two cents in, that's great. If they want to say they're a doctor, that's up to them. But you want to keep the liability at an equal level. Okay? Does the same go for nurses as well? Exactly. Okay. So my next question about that one would be is if they wanted to take over, would it, would, could we just let them take over or do we just keep it all at the same level? We keep it all at the same level. Okay. We're technically Unless working... <laughs> We're technically working under someone else's license. Like we have a medical director who's a doctor who wrote our protocols uh -huh. and they outlined like what it is uh, safe for us to do on the mountain. Okay, I just wanted to make sure about that because I know that just so, my mom's being a nurse about things like well, that. That puts us all at the same level. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. But uh, the idea is that like, even if you were a nurse up there, you should never be doing anything that is uh, out of the scope of OEC and into a nurse's scope. And which means that you're staying in the OEC scope, which makes it fair for you to pass off to someone else in the OEC scope. Okay. Uh, because we're all supposed to operate at that level as is defined in our like Please. protocols that were written by our All right, makes sense. This way you don't create a liability. You know, why didn't that person that's a, that's a patrol or a doctor, why didn't they treat me? You're not at that level. You don't have that medical training. So now you- That makes sense. Okay, so we were on, uh, which one was it? On 12? Uh, uh, yeah. 13. 13. 13, yeah. We're on 13, what's the answer? Which of the following characteristics is not a characteristic of indirect yeah. medical control? Yeah. I, I think communication by radio. That's right. Excellent. I had to read it 20 times. I wasn't sure. <laughs> That's not proper English. <laughs> or, maybe, or maybe I need to go back to school to learn English. That might, might be me as well. <laughs> no, it's just uh, it's the way the book is written. So some of it can be confusing. Yeah. How about number 14? English oh. is not a proper language. So. Uh, protocols, no? A. A is an atom? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. How about number 15? That B. B. Very good. Excellent. So it's all protocol, yes? Yes. Yeah. There's no mm -hmm. other world. There is no policies, procedure, whatever, because we never talked about other world. Okay. But when you see protocol, it's usually the answer. True. You have to say. Are both protocols? They all have a set of protocols. Whether we follow them or not is another story. <laughs> They're set up for a reason. How about number 16? B. 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 B is in boy? Yep. yep. And that's true. How yeah. about number 17? E is in delta. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was simple. Okay. Did I go through all the questions on chapter B? I mean, chapter two? There was only 17. Oh, yeah, the one you were looking at. Yeah, we did them. Uh, no, but David, you were looking. At, you were looking up a question. Did oh, you... uh, no, I'm still. Uh, I'm still. Uh, okay. No, just the seventeen is D to be to be clear. Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm just. Uh, if we can go back to the, the question before, it was. What, so what's the tier three? Oh, that's right. Oh yeah, I found that. Because I got it wrong too. So the key I got, it, I got it right because it's pretty obvious that for the, the tier one is the OEC technician. Tier two, does he, so tier two should be, uh, let me see. Tier two should be uh, EMT and AEMT. Tier three would be what? Para, paramedic? Paramedic, right? Yeah, tier, tier three says advanced EMTs and, and or paramedics. Okay. 
<laughs> but is any of those people in an ambulance anyway? I mean, this is where it's a little bit confusing, yes? You'll never, you'll never come across uh, a yeah. uh, EMT or an AM, uh, there's no AMT or paramedic that's gonna arrive by ski suddenly to help you. So there is the tier one, us, and then the next step is, uh, unless you, we have some AMT uh, at, the, at the resort, sometimes when you get there, I, I just, I'm not understanding the, the escalation. And uh, do you get my question in a way? Or? Yeah, I think I know what you're saying. Um, so, I mean, this, is, this is, you know, in general, not necessarily applies to us, you know, our operation around the mountain, but in some communities, you might only get an EMT that shows up, right? Right. Oh. Are they saying tier four is like a critical care nurse? Like yeah, a yeah, that's, a, that's where it got me because it said tier three does provide advanced life support measures, but it doesn't mention anything about equipment or, or um, um, which is what the question, you know, did specify, advanced life-saving measures and equipment. Whereas apparently paramedics only provide advanced, advanced life-saving um, um, measures. Does that make sense? Right. And also... I think it's the critical care provider. Yeah. That's, I'm thinking that's like a, a flight. Trauma, trauma nurse. Yeah. Trauma nurse. And also they have more drugs. Well, we don't have drugs. Our drugs are very limited to O2, oxygen. Yeah, I understand. But those people then arrive with an ambulance. They usually arrive in an ambulance, true. Okay. They're a rescue. Or some of us work on that le work at that level, but we don't practice on that level when, we, when we're on the hill. We don't well, start IVs or anything like that, even though we're capable of doing it in town. Okay. And doesn't uh, an EMT um, work in an ambulance as well? <laughs> I, remember, I remember we talked about EMTs that they, 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 they were... Uh, uh, just the level above, they cannot, um, they, they cannot um, prescribe any, any medication uh, either, but they start to do internship in hospital. Is that right? Well, each state, they can do certain things. So if you go to California, all they do is EMTs, all they do is transport. They can't do anything. But if you go to another state in a rural area, they, they have more drugs they can play with. It, it all depends on the state. Okay. Your state so protocols. The, okay, so uh, it depends on the state, but all of those people, the MT, the AMT and the paramedics are all arriving by ambulance finally. So at the end of the day, uh, it's just to define tier two and tier three where it's gonna be a little bit more uh, confusing in a way. David, there, there is a difference in who staffs an ambulance as what you call that ambulance. So if an ambulance is staffed by like an AEMT and an EMT basic, you would call it an intermediate life support unit, meaning that it's only has access to intermediate life support measures like certain airways, certain medications. If you put a paramedic or a critical care paramedic on board, now it's an advanced life support unit because they have other uh, intervention that are available their scope. So it's seen as like a different level of care. So even though they're both coming by ambulance, who is on the ambulance uh, determines like what level you would say that ambulance is as a unit. Uh, so that could be the difference in the tier. Maybe tier three is like an AOS unit, advanced life support and tier to you would be an ILS unit or intermediate life support. Mm -hmm. Does that yeah. make sense? Okay, that, it, makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so just to confirm, uh, all ambulances are not equal in a way, and it's the dispatcher that's going to... No, they're not. Uh, that it's the dispatcher that's going to just say, we need advanced life support. We need someone who's able to... Yes, exactly. Okay. And if it's not uh, yes, exactly. Uh, if it's not advanced uh, life support uh, ALS, it's then uh, OL, uh, OLS. You know what is the other one? Uh, it's non -non 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 yeah. intermediate life support. ELS. Okay. Okay. So that's why when dispatch calls for an ambulance, they give the patient's condition, what is going on, and that's when it's determined. Do they send an ILS? or a BLS or an ALS. Yeah, yeah. 
to the yeah, mouth. Okay. So the BLS would be a, a, for someone who just broke his a broke a bone, for example. It, There's it, no it really just, need. To... It just depends, you know. And you have to remember, whatever they're sending, their care is higher than us on the mountain. So that's why you're transferring care to them. Then they have to decide. Once you give them care, you transfer care, it's in their hands. So should we go through, did we answer all the questions on uh, chapter one? Any, you wanna go through it real quick or we're done? Oh, well, we should, yes. <laughs> okay, let's do it really quick, okay? So question one, what did we get on chapter one? Of course, called Outdoor Emergency Care was created by the National Ski Patrol to provide a standard of training. It's B. B. Very good. B. B. How about number two? C. Mini. C is in Charlie? Yeah. Okay. Everyone agree? How about number three? B. B. What? B. B like box. Very good. How about number four? A. Very good. Alpha. Number, yeah. Number, <laughs> number five. B. B. Number five. Is it D as in David or B as in boy? D like David. Well, me yeah, D D like David, but D like Delta. Uh, I was gonna say maybe we should start practicing or <laughs> Delta. Yeah. Bravo, Delta. D oh, like okay. David sounds good to me. We can start good. practicing those phonetics. See, this it's is Delta. Good. Okay. Okay, number five. So it's Delta. Very good. Okay. Number six. Wait, Charlie. 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 Number seven. Alpha. All right. Number eight. Bravo. Bravo. Number nine. Bravo. Okay. Charlie. Bravo. Who said Charlie? Um, David. <laughs> <laughs> okay, David. Number two. Sounds very concerned. Okay, what? Is, it, is it true or is it wrong? Well, you have a couple wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, so is it B or is it C uh, for uh, nine? It's B. B. Are we at number 10? Yes, we are. Yeah. Delta. Okay. 10, what is it? Delta. Very good. Number 11? Delta. Delta. Okay. 12? A is an alpha. Very good. Number 13? Got it. C is in Charlie? Yeah. 14? B, bravo. Okay, 15? A, alpha. A. Okay, 16? Delta. 17? Alpha. Okay. Is Steve there? Yeah. Steve, I only had 17 questions from you for chapter one. Huh. Okay, someone number 18. Delta. Very good. Number 19. Bravo. Uh, wait, eight. eight. What was 18? 18 was Delta. David or Delta. 19 is Bravo. Bravo. Number 20. Bravo. Bravo. And number 21. Bravo. Please, oh. bravo. Okay. And I, and I do have those other four uh, answers here on my sheet. I just didn't type them on the uh, Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Any other questions? I think we did very well. Uh, I have a question, but uh, I don't want to, you know, go too long. Maybe we're going to have us, you know, set, okay, I don't you know. Can ask, ask the question. Um, no, I have the question about chapter one, uh, uh, about liability and how does it work in Nevada specifically? Uh, cause the, the book, it says that uh, the good Samaritan law, 
uh, is referred to state. Uh, so I would like to understand how does it work in Nevada as far also how the laws in Nevada impact on uh, national ski patrol. Uh, as far as the Good Samaritan law? Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. So anyone can sue you. Proper. Okay. Guys. <laughs> anyone. You know, that's a, a famous word. So you have to remember that when you render care, it's you go, only go in your scope that you've been taught. Scope of practice. Don't go out of it. But let's say that you don't take money for it. You don't take gifts for it. You don't do anything like that. So as long as you stay within your scope of practice and you follow the OEC, you're fine. But let's say that you decided, oh my gosh, this guy can't breathe. So I'm going to stick, get a little scalpel and slit his throat just enough to stick a straw in it. That's liability. That's not the Good Samaritan law. That's going beyond your scope of practice. So in the Good Samaritan law, the state recognizes you as long as you don't go out of your scope of practice, but anyone can sue you. And you didn't do it to create, as long as you don't do harm on the patient and you stay within that scope. So you're, you're followed under the, anytime that you render care, you're protected under the Good Samaritan law as long as you don't create harm. Okay, so basically the three conditions are the are valid also are valid in Nevada too. Right. But let's say that you know I'll give you an example that um, you rendered care, you gave this, you know, uh, he's doing fine, he's and he's real happy. Um, okay, choking. You relieved choking from this gentleman, and uh, he was just like really happy about it. Um, he gives you tickets to go to the football game. Three weeks later, he goes to the doctor and he's having trouble breathing. He's got, you know, pain on his side. Doctor looks at him and says, hey, you know, you got a couple broken ribs. Okay. He said, uh, what happened? He says, well, you know, I was choking a couple of weeks ago and this guy from Ski Patrol came along and, and he gave me the Heimlich, you know, and he broke a couple of ribs. Well, guess what? I'm going to sue him because now I can't go to work. I went to a physician. I have a medical bill. I have medical bills now. You know what? I'm going to go after it. So he goes to an attorney and he sees someone. He says, sure, let's do it. And chances are he probably has a good case. You know why? Because you accepted the tickets. Exactly. So don't ever accept anything. So, but if you, if you broke his ribs, hey, he was choking. He should be thankful that he's, he's walking away right now. But you didn't ask for anything in, in return. You did what you were trained. And that was it. So the Good Samaritan law usually protects everyone. But anyone can sue you. Remember that. It's a scary thought. It is. That's why lawyers are what they are. Anything else? Does that make sense? Cool. Yes. Thank you for the explanation. Okay. Uh, yes, I have another question uh, about uh, uh, the call of duty when you are not when you are off duty. Basically, how does it work in Nevada if there is something specific? So, uh, if you have to do something legally, or is something that basically is just a moral obligation uh, that you have to do it? Well, let's just say that you're at a party, or you're walking by someone that has uh, fallen. You can either keep on walking or you can walk by and say, you know what? I'm a paramedic. I'm an EMT. I'm a first responder. You know, I know exactly what to do, but I'm not going to help that guy. I'm just going to keep on walking. 
The best thing for you to do is keep on walking. If you don't want to render, render help, then be quiet about it. Don't brag about it. Hey, I'm a paramedic and they're doing something wrong or I'm a ski patrol and I know how to do that. And also don't put a cross on the back of your car because if you come up on an accident and there's a cross, it tells you that, oh, you're some type of medical person. I'm a physician, I'm in the medical service. I have some training. So you don't have to. And if you've been drinking, don't even think about it. So you don't have to render care. It's up to you. But don't talk, don't talk about it as you're walking by. Say, hey, I, I can do that, but I'm not going to. It's very much if you're not dressed uh, with your uniform, you don't have to render service. You're out of... Uh, it's moral. You're not, yeah, you're, it's just moral. You, you want to do it, you can do it. But otherwise, if you're not dressed and if you have no sign that recognizes that you are a uh, ski patrol or an, an EMA, don't do it, basically. But, you know, once you get into this field, you're, you, you have it in your blood to help people. It yeah. depends on you. But don't do it if you're intoxicated. Any other questions? I'm good. You good? Okay, Greg, what do you say? I'm all good. We all good? <laughs> yep, we're good.